probably hear it pop several times. I don't really have a text because I jumped all over the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But tonight I want to speak about resurrections, Christ and the believers. But mostly we're going to talk about the re resurrections of the believer. You know, I say resurrections because a lot of people don't realize that the, the believer goes through two resurrections. One's a spiritual resurrection, one's a bodily resurrection. I'll explain what I mean by that later. But first we need to know basically what a resurrection is. It's restoring life to that which was dead. A giving of new life or bringing to life again. That's the definition of resurrection. You know, when we, when we think of resurrection though, we automatically add uh, uh, being raised up at the same time. But really the being raised up or what you do after the resurrection is a result of the life being given to you. So it's not the, it's a result instead of the cause of being raised up. But we know that only one who is divine can do this bringing to life again. Either to a dead body or a dead soul. When one has died, you know, he suffered death. Which means that he is in the state of being dead. When you think about that, you know, when you're dead, that's a state of being. And so when, when we understand the meaning of the word death as used in the Word of God, we can understand what the term the state of being uh, dead means. Death in the Bible means separation. It's not, basically it's a separation of relationship instead of a distance. So the term the state of being dead means the state of being separated. That is, from what? Really, it's, it's the body, it's the soul from God, and the body, uh, or the spirit from the body. That's what dead uh, means uh, in the Word of God. It's either separation from the God or separation uh, of the spirit from the body, physical or spiritual death. You know, there are three kinds of death mentioned in the Word of God, spiritual death, physical death, and eternal death. Physical death... Or spiritual death is the separation of the soul from God. Physical or natural death is the separation of the spirit from the body. And eternal death is separation of the body and soul from God for eternity. And the last is only experienced by uh, those who don't know Jesus Christ. So, I mean, the last on the... Uh, the separation of the body and soul from God forever is only uh, what the unsaved uh, experience. We as believers are never separated from God once we become saved. But we can deduct from, the, from this that if death means a separation, then life means a union. Just reverse it. If, there was, if death means a separation, so when the life comes back, it means it's reunited. Say a uniting of the soul to God or a uniting of the spirit with the body. That's what brings life. I said earlier that death means separation, but it does not mean annihilation. In other words, death is not done away with. But death with death uh, does not cease to be. Death can be destroyed, but it's not annihilated either. When death is destroyed, it means it has, become, it has been overcome and has no power to affect that individual detrimentally. Christ overcame death for himself at the resurrection from the dead. From the, uh, at the direction, at the resurrection uh, of the grave from the dead. You know, the last enemy that Christ will destroy, this is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 26. That is, it, uh, is, at the last resurrection, or the final resurrection, Christ will destroy or overcome the enemy for us. That's the death that is overcome. That's the last enemy destroyed. It's the death for us. Our bodies will receive new life and joined with our living soul will rise to either live uh, with our life. We, we will rise to live forever with our Lord. And death no, has no more power over us to affect us in any way. Amen. But death is still around, but it's just not affected, affecting us who are alive. 
But the only thing required of us in a resurrection, whether it be a spiritual or a physical one, is death. That's all we contribute to a resurrection. It's a dead body or a dead soul. If there's no death, there's no resurrection. For to be given life again means the former life possessed was gone, but is now restored. Ephesians 2, 1 tells us that He, Christ, hath quickened, made us alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. We see we were dead, but when and why did we die? When did death begin? Have you ever thought about that? When did death begin? But that takes us back to the beginning of the human race, to the book of Genesis, to the Garden of Eden, to Adam. In the book of Genesis, chapter 2, uh, verse 17, we find God telling Adam, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Adam partook of the forbidden fruit, and that day he died spiritually, and with the sentence of physical death upon him. So we know that he did not die physically that day, but he, but he had the sentence of physical death upon him, which he did later die. This was the beginning of both spiritual and physical death for mankind. And when Adam died spiritually, he lost communion and fellowship with God because his soul was separated from God. He was cast out of the garden, and that's a sign of being out of fellowship with and communion and fellowship with God because it was in the garden that God communed with him. As stated earlier, spiritual death is the separation of the soul from God. Adam was and is the head and representation of all men born of the flesh. Therefore, all who were alive with Adam died with Adam when he sinned. Amen. So, separation of the soul from God, spiritual death, is the condition of everyone who has ever been born or will be born of the flesh. In other words, all men of mankind are born, uh, mankind are born sinners. The sin nature being passed uh, to them from generation to, to generation. And that is through the seed of sinful man. Romans 5.12 states, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Amen. Amen. But now that we found where death began, where death began, and why, as at physical birth, all men are born spiritually dead, we need to know the the remedy or cure for our condition. We need a spiritual resurrection, which is a term for the new birth or being born again of the spirit. These are Jesus' words to Nicodemus in John 3, 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 3, 5, Jesus repeats it. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And verse 7, marvel not that I say unto thee, thou must be, you must be born again. <clears throat> Here we see the necessity of the new birth in order to enter the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is a spiritual uh, kingdom here on earth. Because, and one reason because all that God is and has is spiritual. And so we know that the spirit of God here on earth is an invisible kingdom because it is spiritual. Being born of the Spirit makes one spiritual, that is, <clears throat> that is in state, that is before God, if not in practice. Because the soul has been re re reunited back to God. Because, you know, remember, when we were born again, it's, uh, we were separated uh, from God at our birth. Because all men are born sinners, so at birth is when we were separ separated in our physical bodies from God. Our soul was. And we can, not, we can not experience this new birth until sin has been paid for and death has become life. Remember, Adam and our sin brought forth death, and spiritual death is separation, that is, alienation from God. We cannot pay for our own sins, neither raise ourselves from the dead. Therefore, we need a near kinsman, a substitute. One who has the power to cleanse from sin and give life to the dead. 
We can only find Him in Jesus Christ. Amen. The only begotten Son of God. Said 4.12 says, Acts 4.12 says, For there is no salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You might ask, how can Jesus cleanse or atone for sins and give life to a dead soul? The answer is by his person and work. Amen. Who he is and what he does. He is the only begotten Son of God, of the Father, born of a virgin. So sin or sin nature was not imparted to him. Amen. He took flesh and blood upon himself and became man so that he could identify and die for man. Amen. He lived a sinless life, keeping and, fulfill and fulfilling all the law of God. He was despised and rejected by his own people, but to as many as believed on him gave he e eternal life. He was arrested, tried, and sentenced to death on the cross where he died between two thieves. Yes. He was not found guilty of any crime, yet in his father's plan he had to die. Amen. Dying not for his own sins, but for the sins of his people. Amen. Matthew 121 says, And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. <clears throat> This is why Jesus can be the Savior and substitute for sinful and separated for uh, for sinful and separated men, those dead in trespasses and sins. While showing and proving himself to be the Son of God during his ministry on earth, Jesus, through his ministry of healing, gives us snapshots of the picture of our spiritual resurrection. In other words, our salvation experience. And in other words, in other words, we can make a spiritual application from many of the miracles uh, of his uh, physical healings. So the physical healings, remember, were off the body. I'll give you just a few examples uh, concerning the and sort of the way they can be the physical can be ap applicable to the spiritual. In the physical, the body healings, the body that it. Uh, and the body health is departed from the body. In other words, health is separated from the body. The individual cannot heal himself of his sickness. Jesus' help is the only hope for healing. The uh, infirmity or disease is banished from the body. The body is restored to health because it's, it's uh, reunited with health. And the body is now able to function properly. When we apply it spiritually, we're spiritually dead because the soul by sin is separated from God. In other words, it has de departed from God. The individual cannot atone for his own sins. Amen. Jesus is the only one who can help him, the only Savior. The sin is banished from the individual. The soul is restored to health and life to reunite, reunite with God. And the soul is now able to function properly, to live unto God and to glorify Him. Amen. But this is why salvation is called a miracle, because it is a spiritual resurrection. The individ individual soul is, unite, is reunited to God and lives again. The believer has spiritual life because the Holy Spirit has regenerated him. That is, imparted life to him. And this, is the first this is the first resurrection which a believer experiences, a spiritual resurrection. But there's another resurrection which we are more aware of but have not yet experienced. Because when you think of resurrection, most people think of the final resurrection, the resurrection of the dead at the second coming of Christ. This happens, our bodily resurrection happens at the second coming of Christ. To understand this uh, re resurrection, we have to go back to Christ Jesus, for he is the hope and cause of the believer's bodily resurrection. Amen. Early you heard how the sinless and holy Son of God died on the cross for sinful men and was buried. But we know that he did not stay in the grave. He was resurrected <clears throat> and rose from death and the grave. And that's what we will do. We will be resurrected to life and from the grave. 
it will be body life that we're resurrected to in the last, uh, last resurrection. <clears throat> really, it'd be we're going to be resurrected body uh, uh, with new life in the body and the soul. Because if you remember, when we die physically, our soul goes to be with Christ. And so when Christ comes back, he brings the souls back with him to be reunited with our body. And our body is uh, uh, given life. And so you know, when it's re re reunited with our soul, both body and soul are, are live unto God. But the resurrection of Christ is the cornerstone of the gospel and the capstone of Christianity. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, Paul says, If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. He continues in 5, 17, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. The resurrection of Christ is what makes Christianity unique and different from all religions in the world. We believe and serve a risen Savior. Amen. No one else, no other religion can make that claim. The bodily resurrection of Christ is especially the argument, the claim, and assurance of the resurrection of believers. The resurrection of us. That is resurrection to glory. For God chose and appointed him, that is Jesus, to be the example and source from whom all divine blessings should be given to us. Therefore, Jesus can say, because I live, ye shall also live. Amen. That's John 14, uh, 19. This is the promise given to believers of their body resurrection at the rapture. Now that we have established that there will be a bodily resurrection and that Christ is a forerunner and example of ours, I want to mention uh, three miracles that I believe picture the bodily res resurrection of believers. The New Testament records only three instances where Christ raised the dead. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with them. But they're... The first one is found in all three Gospels, Mark 9, 18 through 26, Mark 5, 21 through 33, and Luke 8, 40 through 56. This is the account of the raising of Jairus' 12-year-old daughter back to life. The second one is found in Luke 7, 11 through 17, the raising of the widow's son of, at Nain. And the third account is in John 11, 1 through 44, the raising of Lazarus from the death and the grave. In fact, Lazarus is the only one that was raised from the grave. This account, I think, is the best picture of the three miracles because uh, the one in John 11, the one of Lazarus, is the best picture of the three uh, of the best picture of the three miracles because it is more full and detailed than the others. In fact, it's uh, I think 44 verses uh, from beginning to end. We don't know the time. Or we don't have the time to turn to all the accounts and read them, but uh, I'll give you a summary, a summary or the gist of what happened in those three resurrections. In Mark 5, 21 through 33, Jairus, one of the rulers of the synagogue in Capernaum, came to Jesus who was speaking to a multitude uh, at the seashore. He beseeches Jesus to come and lay his uh, hands on his 12-year-old daughter who is sick and at the point of death in order that she might be made whole and live. Jesus goes with him and on the way to Jairus' house, Jesus is delayed by the woman who had an issue of blood. She touches the hem of Jesus' garment uh, and is healed physically. But after the delay, Jesus continues on the way, although Jairus had been brought word that his daughter was now dead. Arriving at the house, Jesus informs the crowd that the damsel is not dead but asleep. They laugh him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. At least they thought she was. Well, technically she was dead, but to Christ she was asleep. Jesus puts them out of the house and with only five witnesses, Peter, James, John, and the mother and father of the uh, young girl, goes into the room where the young girl is and says to her, Talitha Kumai. The girl awakens, gets up, and walks all to the great amazement of the five witnesses. You would think the, the, the disciples wouldn't be that amazed because they had seen him raise the widow's son. 
But it says all five were, were greatly amazed. But I guess also you can, you can continue to be amazed at Christ no matter what he does. And then the young girl is uh, instructed to be given food. Luke 7, 11 is the account of the Jesus raising the widow's son. And upon approaching the gates of the city of Nain, Jesus is met by a funeral procession, <clears throat> which had left the gates and was on the way to the, uh, to the grave. They were going to bury a young man who would, and he would be carried uh, to the grave on a bier. And Jesus stops the pro pro procession and touches the bier. This is B-I-E-R, not B-U-Y-E-R. <laughs> but, uh, but because of compassion for the widow woman, Jesus places his hand on the bier, stopping the funeral procession, and then after telling the woman to weep no more, raises the young man to life and takes him and turns him over to his mother. So that was the, the second resurrection. <clears throat> then the third resurrection that I think we're mostly familiar with is the resurrection of Lazarus, John 11, 1 through 45. <clears throat> Jesus has brought word from Mary and Martha that Lazarus, their brother, and the one whom Jesus uh, was, uh, loved was sick. But Jesus did not immediately go. He stays two more days, it says, in the place where he was. Then Jesus tells his disciples that our friend Lazarus sleepeth. He says, but I go that I may wake, awake him out of sleep. This is John 11, 11. They start on their, way, on their way to Bethany, the town of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But in the meantime, uh, Lazarus has died. Not only had he died, but he'd already been buried too. And when Jesus arrived, John 11, 17, uh, it tells us that Jesus found that Lazarus had lain in the grave four days already. And he's taken to the grave, which was a cave covered by a rock, by Mary and Martha, whom Jesus calls, and then Jesus calls out to Lazarus, Lazarus come forth. And we know that Lazarus emerges from the grave, still bound by hand and foot by grave clothes. He, and Jesus orders someone uh, to take off the, gar the, glo the, uh, the <laughs> take off the grave clothes and set him free and let him go, it says. So that's basically the three uh, miracles that Jesus performed. And all of those have aspects of our spiritual resurrection when we come to Christ. We can, well, I showed you some earlier to so make the application from the physical to the spiritual. But no one miracle depicts the complete way because it's just parts. Uh, there are many ways that, uh, not many ways to come to Christ. I guess from, from many avenues that you come to Christ. But, but everybody has to come to Christ one way, which is by faith. Amen. But, it, but in these three miracles, there are similarities, comparisons, and contrasts. Uh, in, indicative of some aspects of the believer's future resurrection. If I had time, I would uh, give a... Uh, I may have time to do several, but uh, we'll see how the time goes. But there's one thing I want to get in, in order, before I uh, do any... What it is, I had extra notes that uh, I wanted to bring in if I had time, but there's something... There's one thing I want to make sure is... It's important that those in every age group, children, young people, and adults be prepared for the coming and final resurrection. And we find this because if you remember in the res three resurrections that Christ did, one was a young child, 12 years old, one was a young man, and one was an adult. So that covers all three different uh, age groups. When one dies, his or her destination is already determined. The only way to be prepared is to be in Christ, and that is only by way of salvation, which is repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The three individuals raised from the dead learned without a doubt the, the, inevitable, inevitable, 
the inevitability uh, or certainty of death and the cessation of all worldly hopes and desires and the worthlessness of them in the light of, of eternity. Fellowship and communion with God is begun, developed to a certain degree, and enjoyed on this side of the grave and resurrection. Amen. This fellowship and communion is the bud of the, of the future flower. It isn't complete. Like I say, it's just a bud. In heaven, our fellowship and commun communion has blossomed and become the flower in all its beauty and glory. And it's to be enjoyed forever. But there's a word, word of warning also. Physical death <clears throat> does not change the desires that you had on earth. If there are no desires at all for fellowship and communion with God now, that is while you're living on earth, there will be no desires for fellowship and communion later, that is after resurrection. Heaven would not be the place you wanted to be or desired to be, and you wouldn't be fitted for it either. But after being saved, there has to be a desire for God and spiritual knowledge. The degree of desire will vary with each individual, but it should grow stronger the closer we get to God. Amen. But this is an uh, evidence of salvation, not salvation itself. It's imperative, though, that one has faith in God and has a desire for, for God in order that it might be manifest that one is a child of God. We need to ask ourselves, am I a child of God? And if we are, we will be in that final resurrection when Christ comes. But we also need to remember, there will also be a final resurrection for the unsaved. But those individuals will be resurrected to damnation and suffering forever in the lake of fire. So we need to make sure that we're in the right resurrection. You know, there's two things needful for a lost person uh, that two things that are needful for a lost person uh, to enjoy fellowship and communion with God in glory. First of all, they must come to Christ, that is the first resurrection, which is salvation. And secondly, they must they must go with Christ, which is the final resurrection, the rapture. Amen. But when we look at the three miracles. I'm going to go back and just make a few uh, comments on the miracles. When we look at the three miracles, one was sick, Lazarus. One was at the point of death, the young girl. And one was dead, the widow's son. One was young, we said this earlier, one was young, one was a young man, and one was an adult. One had just died, the young girl. One was on the way to the grave, the widow's son. And one was in the grave, Lazarus. And when Christ returns, there will be a fourth category, those believers who are still alive. We need to also note in uh, these um, accounts of the three resurrections to life, Jesus calls death asleep in two of them. And him calling death asleep imports two things, at least two things. One of is that death is only temporary, and secondly, that there will be an awakening. We find that the calling it asleep in Mark 5, 39, and John 11, 11. We find in the, all three resurrections, though, there's a mention of weeping. You know, we know weeping is normal it's, uh, at uh, death. There was, let's see, in all three, re res in all three resurrections, there was weeping, that, which is you, as uh, normal, before the individual was raised to life. But there is no record of anyone weeping or crying after of the resurrections. In Mark 5, 38 and Luke 9, 52, it says that many were weeping and bewailing the death of the 12-year-old girl. In Luke 7, 13, the widow was weeping as her son was being carried to the grave. And in John 11, 33, Mary and the Jews who were with her were weeping. 
In each case, in the three different gospel accounts, Jesus tells them to weep not. And this is, uh, and this is abnormal. Like I said, weeping at funerals are normal, but uh, not weeping is abnormal. That is, if you love the individual. But then we find, too, there in verse 35 of John 11, Jesus weeps. And I thought that was, I don't know the significance of all that, but I just thought that uh, when I read it, uh, that's one thing I noticed, the weeping in all three of them. And then it says, Jesus telling them not to weep, and then he weeps. You know, I've heard many, well, not many, but a lot of sermons about why, I mean, when this is, why did Jesus weep? I don't think anybody has the answer. We, they might, but they probably, they probably wouldn't know it's right, or the others don't. Somebody does it. Uh, we know he did not weep for sorrow, as the others did. The reason for that is, because he knew he was going to raise it to life. There was no need for him to weep for that. So it wasn't for sorrow. I, personally, I don't know why we have to have my opinion, which I give, but it's just uh, just the information that I have at this time, or the enlightenment. Like I said, there are many opinions, but I don't think anyone on the earth knows for sure. Judging from 1133, John 1133, my opinion would be that Jesus wept because of disappointment, of disappointment in and compassion to those who, though being close to him, did not have enough faith to trust him and rely on him at this time to handle the situation. That's the closest I can come to. And also in John 11:39, uh, we have that phrase: "By na by this time he stinketh, for he hath been in been for he hath been dead four days." John does not let corruption of the body of Lazarus. Uh, John, Jesus does not let corruption of the body of Lazarus deter him from raising him back to life. First Corinthians 15:50 says that corruption does not inherit incorruption. So Jesus reverses the corruption of the body at the same time he gives life and raises it. You know, none of the three recorded accounts or sayings of Martha, Mary, and some of the Jews uh, doubted the ability of Jesus to raise an individual back to health. It was his ability and power to raise an individual back to life that was not believed. So see, there's, there's a lot more applications, and I had more notes, but I uh, didn't have them all written down because it, it, I already had about 20-something uh, pages double space. <laughs> and a lot of the notes I had, I didn't use because it went a different direction. So, uh, so this is some of the, some of these, last ones are some of the notes that I had that, uh, that I didn't use, what I wasn't planning on using. So. But there's one other thing about Lazarus' resurrection that I didn't see until this time. It just uh, came to me when I was studying. After the resurrection of Lazarus, what was the next thing you hear about him? Does anybody know? Next thing you hear about Lazarus after he's resurrected from the day, dead. Something we, supposedly, I guess we'll do in heaven, too. Something before that. Uh, what it was, he was sitting at the supper table eating a meal with Jesus. And I thought that was pretty. What about the marriage feast of the Lamb? I'd never seen that before. Like I said, I'd never seen that before I was looking at this. He was uh, sitting at a supper table eating a meal with Jesus. Uh, it was prepared. Uh, Martha was serving, and Mary was at the feet of Jesus, anointing his feet with a spikenard, a fragrant ornament. But I put down, does not this picture the marriage supper of the Lord, of the Lamb? Revelation 19.9. This is also the last mention of what Lazarus did after being raised to life from the grave. In the latter part of the same chapter, John 12, 9 through 11, it is recorded about Lazarus. It says, 
that the chief priest wanted Lazarus killed. And why? Because they wanted him dead because of his uh, testimony, because people saw that he was alive. So that was the last we hear of Lazarus there. And then last, one last... I said one last thing, but it looked like I've gone far long enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did say we were changing places, so I'll go a little off. <laughs> I'll close with this. In the three re resurrection performed by Jesus, all are similar and associ associated with the restoration of family ties. One was a daughter, one was a son, and one was a brother. And these were the ones restored. Two of them had no brothers or sisters, while one of them had two sisters. One was healed at the request of a father. One was healed because of Jesus' compassion on the mother. And the one was healed at the request of two sisters. We can gather from these facts that our resurrection at Christ's second coming will be a restoration of family ties. A reunion of our physical family and especially a reunion with our, physical, our spiritual brothers and sisters with Christ as the head of the family. But we do, the main thing we need to realize or know, are we in that first resurrection? Or the final resurrection. And you don't get into the final resurrection until you're in the first resurrection, which is salvation. Which we said is faith toward God and our repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's one thing needed for all of us. It's faith in the blood of Christ. Of course, he died on Calvary's cross for that uh, purpose. And we, and we have his example after that, that if he rose from the grave, we will also raise, uh, be raised from the grave by him. But we have a lot to be thankful for. And, and, and the more you realize what you have in Christ, the more you're willing to seek to live for him. We do it imperfectly, but at least we have a, more of a desire to be more like Christ. And so, but I'll close. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word.